Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Labor Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And we're talking about methane. These are some of the key terms that are important to know if we're dealing with uh, methane in the Arctic. The active layer, it's the top part of permafrost soil. It thaws annually in the summer and refreezes in the winter. So it's a small layer at the surface that uh, thaws, refreezes, thaws, refreezes. Underneath is the permafrost, which stays frozen. An anaerobic environment. Um, there's no free oxygen available. So in sediments and in wetlands, no free oxygen. So the microbes breaking down carbon. There's no oxygen available. So you don't get CO2, you get methane, CH4. Anaerobic environment. Cryoturbation or frost churning. Various horizons or layers of the soil, there's freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. Okay, so when you get uh, freezing, you get expansion, thawing, you get um, a reduction or contraction. Okay, this causes cracks in the soil, it causes hexagonal patterns, it causes different things. Um, and if there's uh, organic material that then thaws out, um, could be broken down and you can get the methane produced. A thermokarst lake basin. So it's, if you have this lake that drains naturally by contact with a river system or other lower lying lakes, the water drains out, then you get a basin in the Arctic um, with no water in it. It's drained, uh, it's a thermokarst drain basin. Ebullition is bubbles. Bubbles that come out through sudden and erratic release of gas, large content of methane usually, wet soils and sediment. So it's bubbles coming up, ebullition. Now peatlands, you can have dry and wet ecosystems. Organic material or peat, large component. Peatlands must, in, the, in a past or present perspective, have been considered as mires, accumulating organic matter, a surplus of organic matter that accumulated in the ground. The definition of a peatland is an area with or without vegetation with a natural accumulated peat layer at the surface, according to the International Peat Society. You might want to join. Permafrost table. It's the top of the frozen soil horizons between the active layer. So the active layer is at the surface, then you have this permafrost table or a horizon underneath you have the permafrost. The taiga, taiga, is a biome dominated by coniferous forests, spruce, pine, and larch in the north, okay? Um, Talix, year-round unfrozen ground. They often lie in, they lie in permafrost areas. So it's all, the ground is all frozen around, and then you have this talic, a region of unfrozen ground. For example, next to or beside or underneath lakes and rivers where the deep water does not freeze in winter, so the soil underneath does not freeze either. Thermokarst is the subsidence and erosion processes created by thawing an ice-rich permafrost. So if you have an ice-rich permafrost and you thaw it, the water, okay, um, the water, you, you're melting the ice, you get a contraction, the, the water drains off, the ground can drop and create this uh, thermokarst uh, lake. Subsidence of soil by thawing of permafrost, it's oversaturated with ice. The ice content is very large. When the ice thaws, there's less material, things collapse in, and you get this thermokarst lake, which can then drain into rivers and other lakes that are lower. Now the tundra, you can have wet and dry tundra. Tree growth is hindered by low temperatures and short growing season. So you go further and further north, the vegetation gets shorter and shorter, eventually you just have shrubland, you can't support trees. It means treeless mountain tract. You also get it up as you go up in elevation. Tundra is in vast areas of the Arctic, you have wet tundra overlapping with the global wetland category. Then you can have medium wet or mesic tundra and dry tundra. Now wetland, very broad characterization of an ecosystem Vegetation is, is used to constant inundation with water. It's saturated with water, either permanently or seasonal, so it takes on the characteristics of a distinct ecosystem. 
The main wetland types include swamps, marshes, bogs, and fens. Okay, and Yodoma deposits, well, the, the, the uh, this is ice-rich Pleistocene lowest deposits, windblown deposits of mixed origin. Um, they, they deposits have been able to move, but there's frozen organic carbon. It may have a total ice volume content of 30 to 90%. This is in Siberia where you get these very large water content, so you get very large uh, sinks and drops and contraction, and we're getting these uh, blowholes. Um, now, before, before I go, okay, so, well, let's keep going here. Okay, so, methanogenesis. That's the pathway to methane formation. So we can have climate, environmental effects, so-called distal, and there's proximal or chemical uh, controlling effects. Whenever chemical proximal in, in one region, distal distant. So we can have, so topography has a big factor, right? Because that affects drainage. And then you have a water table. Climate, the amount of precipitation and the temperature and the plants that grow. Okay. Um, and uh, you also have uh, respiration. Of, of the plants at night um, and uh, of course of organisms as well um, but you have uh, basically if you have oxygen present then you don't get a lot of methane right because this is aerobic decomposition um, so the plants are in soils there's fermentation processes depending on temperature and basically there's other processes so if you have oxygen you tend to get Hydrogen gas, you get CO2 produced, you get methyl hydroxide, CH3, COOH form, you don't get methane. Um, if there's hydrogen and, and uh, this, this guy here, um, you're kind of in the middle, you get some methane and, and some CO2 and these other things. Uh, pH is a factor, the amount of sulfate is a factor. And uh, then on this side here, you get mostly just methane. If you have, uh, you know, the, uh, less and less oxygen um, and the pH is sufficient, it is satisfactory, it would be acidic, and you've got the sulfates bringing the acidity down, you get more methane produced here. So you get, you get a continuum of production sort of between CO2 and methane, depending on the conditions. So this is a... This is, so plants can influence the methane emission, vascular plants. Um, so here you have ox, you're near the surface, or you're near, um, there could be a bit of water here. There's oxygen available. There's CO2 available in the air. Methane is, okay, so there's anaerobic, there's aerobic CH4 consumption. So there's oxygen available, the methane produced is consumed, this is a water table. Below the water table, there's less oxygen. It's anaerobic methane production. This is in the. This is a root, a plant root. So you have uh, the. You have oxygen. If there's oxygen, it consumes the methane, produces CO2. There's the methane here from from the processes of decomposition of organic matter and the processes of plant growth. Some of this methane can go right up through the vascular network and come up into the air. You can also have methane in this region diffusing upwards, um, and it can be oxidized to CO2, or it can go escape and come up into the air as, as methane. Or you can have bubbles coming up, methane heavy, heavy in methane, lots of methane in the bubbles coming up into the air. So you can have all of these processes occurring. Now how do we measure the methane? Okay, there's something called, we can use, um, there, there's tunable diode lasers that can scan across the absorption lines of different gases and you have the wavelength of the laser tuned to the absorption line of methane, then you can measure the concentration of methane to very, very low concentrations, much less than parts per billion. Um, and you, th there's an eddy covariance method 
Um, now, one of the problems, these lasers needed liquid nitrogen cooling and electrical power, but now with better, la better lasers, you can use less and less uh, power. They don't need liquid nitrogen cooling. You can also have these things on aircraft and satellites. So this is a network here that is measuring the gas. And <coughs> here's some of the data. Okay, so this is a two year span. Um, this is the methane flux in milligrams per square meter of ground per hour. This is the methane coming out. Um, this is over two years. This is on a month to month basis. And what you can see is in the summer month, um, June, July, August, September, June, July, August, September, much, much more methane coming out. Um, okay, because of the thawing. Um, this is, uh, tells you where it is. This is an Arctic site, a subarctic perm permafrost mire, Stordalen, northern Sweden. Okay, so you can see the change over two years on a month to month, even higher resolution day to day basis. Now, where are the methane stations in the Arctic? These are northern study sites. Okay, so you can see different sites here. Um, chamber method, this is like flasks, and then measure the concentration. Chamber plus um, uh, eddy covariance, eddy co covariance, eddy covariance only modeling and so on. So these are the sites and what, how they do their measurements of methane. Now, this is a summary of 120 published studies on a per square meter basis. So emissions to the atmosphere in grams of methane per square meter um, per summer or per year. So for the, for the season, the summer or for the year. Okay, so here's the summer. And here's the annual. So most of the um, emissions are during the summer. Um, in the wet tundra sites, um, there's most in the summer, okay, more. The, the mean of these is the mean of all the sites. Um, and in the dry mesic tundra, is, uh, there's much less in the dry regions. Okay, so this is what's coming out. Um, how much organic material how much carbon is in the soil? The so this is soil organic carbon content, zero to one meter depth. So it's kilograms of carbon per square meter, okay, per square meter per area. And it's, oh, it's between zero and one meter down. So between zero and one meter down, and what it's showing you is the, the regions that are the highest or the darkest. So right up here, parts of Canada, some of the Canadian Archipelago Islands, um, lots over here in this region. Um, okay, so you can see the distribution and uh, there's a lot more over, over in this region than, than uh, but you can see it all around. This is just on land, of course. Okay, um, and recent estimates, how much altogether? So you can divide it zero to three meters depth. Okay, 1024, this is petagrams of carbon. And uh, 750, 1034, 1104 estimate. Deeper than three meters, 241, 250. So if you add the total, add this column to this column, 1672 petagrams of carbon, which is gigatons of carbon or 1400 to 1850. So these estimates are huge. So if a small fraction of this carbon decomposes, there will be huge amounts of, of uh, methane emitted. Now, how's carbon lost from Arctic soils with permafrost, fire excluded? Okay, so we, we have a river here, we have erosion processes, you get dissolved in particulate carbon, it's broken down, anaerobically to produce methane, aerobically to produce CO2 here. Um, you can have aerobic stuff going on here again. Um, and then if you have water and you have stuff going on, there's a talic on frozen ground, then you get more and more um, anaerobic. So the methane, the line is the, the concentration, more and more methane here, less CO2. And you have other regions where you get a mix as well. Thank you.